Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Bart K is a former senior lecturer in human physiology and a professor of health science. Bart worked in academia for several decades as a teacher, a publishing researcher, and as a consultant. Pleasure, Judy. First of all, thank you very much for having me back again. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and to your people. And if you're not subscribed to my channel as well, folks, do consider going across there and subscribing. We're looking at an image of the, um, the discoverer or the proposer, if you like, of the Randall cycle. This is Sir Philip Randall, 1926 to 2006. And he proposed the Randall cycle in an article which was published in April of 1963. Why is this so important, Judy? Well, this is important because there are a number of commentators currently running around on the internet suggesting to people that it's a really good idea on the carnivore diet for you to add in an amount of carbohydrate every day for various reasons. The Randall cycle suggests a number of things to us, including the absolutely unequivocal means definite, the definite reason why that is absolutely definitely contraindicated, which is another word for don't do that. It is bad for you. Basically, the way we need to view carbohydrate in the diet is we need to view it as what it is, and that is it is a toxin. For the last four and a half million years, give or take, humans and immediately pre-human species have lived on this planet under a given lifestyle, that lifestyle being obligate hypercarnivore. How do we know that is true? What we can do is a thing called stable isotope testing. What we can do is we can find the human and, and immediately pre-human remains. There are skeletons, skeletal structures, long bones that are left behind. We can find those all over the world. And we can open those long bones up and we can get some collagen out of those bones. Collagen is a protein. It's the most common protein in the human body. And you'll find a significant amount of collagen in long bones. Collagen is a very stable protein. It dries out, obviously, after the body dies, but it remains intact for tens and hundreds of thousands of years. No problem at all. We can still find viable collagen in the long bones millennia later, even. And we can analyze the makeup of that collagen in terms of the stable isotope makeups, in terms of the carbon and the nitrogen found in that collagen in those long bones. And that tells us, slam dunk, it tells us what that individual definitely ate during its lifetime, down to the specific speciation of animals that that human being was predating on and eating. And what that data tells us is that human beings, for at least 350,000 years, which is as long as human beings have existed in our current form, we have definitely unequivocally eaten a diet which consisted 80% the flesh and fat of large ruminant animals, with a few other animals thrown in here and there, and 20% very, very fibrous, very, very starch, poor roots and tubers, basically very, very fibrous materials. And that 20% of fibrous materials was stuff that we were digging up, collecting, taking home, boiling the hell out of probably, and eating as some kind of gruelly slop type stuff to subsist when the hunt was unsuccessful or the animals were not there to predate upon. Okay, and it wasn't starch rich like current tubers and roots are that have been selectively bred to be so. This was basically fiber is what these people were eating. Now, as you know, fiber breaks down in the enteric system only under the influence of bacteria that basically break it down a little bit. And what they produce for us is short chain fatty acids not carbohydrates, okay? So basically, the human diet for 350,000 years, up to the point where the agrarian revolution kicked in about 8,000 years ago, human beings ate a diet which, to all intents and purposes, was 100% protein and fat, given that the fiber broke down to short-chain fatty acids and not carbohydrates. There was no carbohydrate in the human diet at all. 
None. Zero. What about when they say that there was like berries around? Okay, two weeks a year, yes, two, two or three weeks a year, seasonally for some human beings, there were berries around. Um, I'm talking across the, the vast majority of the year, the other 50 weeks of the year or so, give or take, no carbohydrates at all, zero. So good, thanks. Great correction there. Absolutely right. It's important that people understand that these two angles are two aspects of looking at the same thing. This is not an either or situation. A lot of people, because I, sh I show two diagrams and I talk about one diagram, this one being where glucose is the predominant fuel source in the body and the other one where fats are the predominant fuel source in the body. And people then go away sometimes with the idea that either or situation prevails. No. Both these two charts that I'm going to show you are both in effect at all times simultaneously. I hope that's clear. This is a this is a this and that, not this or that situation. And that's very, very important to understand. Okay, so what are we looking at here? At the top of this image, we're looking at a blue area there where it says glucose and LCFA, which stands for long chain fatty acids. That blue space is the extracellular fluids outside of the cell. In this case, it's the blood, the extracellular fluid. It's that series of compartments of fluids um, in the body. In other words, outside the cell membrane, outside of the, of the working cell. Then we have a tan colored area or the middle section there where most of the action appears to be. That is the cell fluid, the cell cytosol inside the fluid, but outside of the mitochondria. So if you remember, mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. The mitochondria is where you generate most of your ATP for your cellular work, your, your the, the, the roles that cells do. Mitochondria, basically, the reaction factories where we, we, we react oxygen with hydrogen to re grossly oversimplify the thing. And thus, we make water and release a bunch of chemical energy in so doing because that's exothermic. And that energy is encapsulated to a large degree to make ATP, which is our cellular energy currency, if you like to think of it that way. All right, so that's the tan area in the middle. And the green area is inside the mitochondria, the workings inside the mitochondria, where all that energy, all that ATP is created. All right. This is the situation where a person has been consuming a diet which is rich in carbohydrates. Now, let me define rich in carbohydrates for you right up front so that you know what I mean by rich in carbohydrates. You have a requirement in your body because of your brain's total dependence really upon glucose to survive and also because every muscle cell in your body requires glucose to be able to function, a really active human being, not a completely sedentary human being, or not an athlete, but sort of somewhere middle of the road sort of person who is active, typically to maybe 300 grams of carbohydrates per day is the requirement for life. Okay. Luckily, the human body has a system to generate that two to 300 grams of carbohydrate itself. And it generates that from non-carbohydrate precursors. For example, the glycerol backbones of fatty acid molecules, lactate, which comes from pyruvate, as you can see at the bottom of the screen there. And there are a number of what's called, what are called gluconeogenic amino acid precursors as well. So basically what I'm telling you is you are capable, your body has all the enzymes to make sugar, to make glucose from glycerol out of, out of fat molecules, from monocarboxylates such as pyruvate, lactate, that sort of stuff, and also from some of the proteins that you consume. That's what's kept us alive for 350,000 years while there was basically zero carbohydrates available except for maybe a couple of weeks during the year when the berries were ripe. Anything over and above that is toxic. So does that mean that you have the ability to eat 300, 200, 200 or 300 grams of carbohydrates and get away with it a day? No, because gluconeogenesis doesn't stop. It's, it's going to keep happening because your body is so attuned to making glucose every day because it's 
that's how your genes are designed. That's what it's supposed to do. You're not supposed to eat any carbohydrates at all. So any carbohydrate basically whatsoever that you pour down your neck on any given day almost certainly is going to end up being a problem in terms of this Randall cycle here. Here is why. Glucose in the bloodstream, glucose here at the top, outside the cell, in other words, that's been delivered to the cell because you've got glucose in your blood, you've got glucose in your blood, A, because of gluconeogenesis, and B, because you've poured carbohydrates down your neck in your diet as well. The glucose is transported from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell in on a transporter, a, a protein transporter called GLUT4. GLUT4 transports glucose from the outside to the inside. Then what happens is we have a series of reactions and we have two isoforms of another enzyme called phosphofructokinase, PFK, isoform 1 and isoform 2, and they function in order to bring the glucose down to the next step in the chain. So we then get a molecule resulting from those interactions there called fructose 1,6-biphosphate, or in this case, it's just called FRU 1,6P2. Fructose 1,6-biphosphate. Okay, fantastic. From there, a molecule called pyruvate is generated by some other enzymes, and then pyruvate goes through a series of reactions when you're using glucose as a fuel source, where it's broken down to a substance called acetyl coenzyme A in the middle here. Acetyl coenzyme A is the feed in, the fuel source, if you like, that runs a thing called the Krebs cycle, or usually it's called the TCA cycle. Sometimes it's called the tricarboxylic acid cycle. You will have heard of one of those terms. It's the main cycle that is used to produce hydrogen for reaction with oxygen in the mitochondria to create water, release energy, and that energy is used to make ATP. And the end results of that are carbon dioxide plus water. So basically what happens is the carbon hydrogen skeletons of the food stuff are split apart. The hydrogens are fed down one chain. The carbon is added to oxygen and that's what we get basically. That causes the Randall, not the Randall, the TCA cycle to proceed more rapidly because you're now feeding it with more fuel, the acetyl coenzyme A. And the first intermediary of the TCA or Krebs cycle is a thing called citrate. Sometimes it's referred to as citric acid. It's the stuff that you find in oranges and lemons and citrus fruit. It's also the first intermediary of the TCA cycle in, in the body. And then if there is a buildup of citrate inside the mitochondria because there is a lot of glucose going in there, then that citrate will leak out into the cell cytosol back into the tan area so now we're up here and if there's a buildup of citrate in that cell fluid that will directly deactivate pho phosphofructokinase 1 it will also deactivate GLUT4 what's going on here Judy why would it do that well sugar glucose inside our cells at a concentration above what our cells are designed to run on is toxic. It causes damage to protein structures, which is what a cell is. It's a protein structure. It causes damage to DNA in the nucleus of the cell. It destroys cell membranes. Basically, the disease diabetes is elevated blood sugar. Why does the blood sugar elevate? Precisely because the Randall cycle protects the more important parts of your body, the cells of the body, from that damage. How does it do that? It locks that door, the GLUT4. That is what insulin resistance is. It's your cell telling the external environment, the blood, we do not require any more sugar in the cell. In fact, if there was more sugar in the cell than there is right now, it would start destroying the cell. We do not require any more sugar in the cell. In fact, if there was more sugar in the cell than there is right now, it would start destroying the cell. So the cell protects itself. It locks the door right there. It also stops the production of sugar through that pathway by blocking out PFK1 as well. 
So basically too much sugar locks itself out. It's also immediately unlockable as soon as all that excess sugar has run through the system that drags the citrate back down that unlocks the door and lets more sugar in. If you eat more sugar though, it will lock the door again. So hang on, you you weren't listening before. So hopefully that makes some good sense there. All right. So too much sugar will lock out sugar. The other thing that also happens is because you've got a whole bunch of acetyl coenzyme A pooling because of all of the sugar going through this pathway here, what that will actually do is also that will lock out this long chain fatty acyl coenzyme A molecule from becoming acetyl coenzyme A through allosteric inhibition, basically. So not only does the sugar lock out sugar, it locks out fat as well. So now what we've got is a situation where neither sugar nor fat can feed the cell the energy because there's too much energy already there. It doesn't need any more energy. There is plenty of substrate to run the TCA cycle to produce the reducing equivalents for the oxygen to produce the ATP. That cell is running at maximum capacity. More fuel is just going to damage the cell, so it locks everything out, basically. So that's that's the situation where you've got a lot of sugar happening. So the take-home message here is this. Sugar above the concentration that sugar should be is always toxic and will always activate the Randall cycle to some degree or another. Also important to understand that the Randall cycle is not an on-off situation. It's a sliding scale situation where when I'm saying this locks out that, I don't mean on-off switch, I mean a slidable scale from Fully, that stuff can traverse through the pathway through to fully blockaded and nothing gets through. So the particular energetic state of every individual cell determines that cell's ability to either oxidize substrates and produce energy or to be somewhat inhibited, moderately inhibited, very inhibited, or indeed completely blocked, depending on how much energy has pulled in that cell. So when you get a systemic situation where your whole body is full of sugar, everything is locked up. And it's locked up precisely to protect the cells from damage. So the sacrificial lamb, if you like, becomes the red blood cells, which we measure the damage to our red blood cells through glycative damage via a thing called the HbA1c test, which tells us basically how high our blood sugars have been over the last 28 days or so. And the other sacrificial lamb becomes the epithelial cells which line our vascular tree. Because those cells can be replaced generally much more rapidly, and because generally in our evolutionary past there was no amount of carbohydrate being consumed to speak of, this was a a very rare occasion where this, this cycle would be activated, and the body had 50 weeks of the year to repair itself. As such, no real big deal. And so given that epithelial cells replace themselves every few months, as do red blood cells, fine, we'll, we'll, we'll sacrifice these guys. They can be damaged by this high circulating sugar, and that's no real issue. The problem nowadays is that we're doing it, most of us, all the time, every day, multiple times a day. We are pouring sugar into our systems. Now, when I say sugar duty, strike the word sugar and insert carbohydrates. All carbohydrates break down to sugar. Only exception is fructose, which is metabolized directly to fat in the liver because there's no glucose yet. But to all intents and purposes, anything you eat that contains carbohydrate, metabolically it is sugar, and it is toxic for that reason. Simple as that. We've got a cell that's jammed up. That means that both glucose and fat will start to pool in your bloodstream. Extra glucose pooling in your bloodstream gets metabolized to fat in the liver. Extra fat in your blood gets transmitted back to triacylglycerides in your liver as well. That goes straight to your adipose tissue, your fat cells, and you become an insulin-resistant fatty all because you're pouring carbohydrates down your neck multiple times a day. Simple as that. Now, if you're very, very active, you can get away with this. If you're young-ish, as is Dr. Paul, you can get away with this. However, it will catch up with him, and it will catch up with you if you take his advice and eat carbohydrates every day. You will be activating your Randall cycle. That will cause an insulin resistance problem sooner or later. Here is the second way of looking at the same 
situation. This is Randall cycle situation B, if you like. This is the one that the plant-based supporters, the, the vegans will bang on. This is the one that they will present without presenting what I've just presented to you in terms of what carbohydrates will do to you. And they'll say, here's what happens if you eat a lot of fat, is what they say. Right, so once again, we have the blue, which is outside of the cell. We have the tan, which is inside the cell. And we have the green, which is inside the mitochondria. We have long chain fatty acids in the fluids outside the cell. They are transported into the cell on a transporter called CD36, as it turns out. Once inside the cell, a bunch of other enzymatic reactions take place and those long chain fatty acids are broken down into long chain fatty acyl coenzyme A. Long chain fatty acyl coenzyme A is transported from the cell cytosol into the mitochondria on a protein transporter called CPT1. And then through a process of beta oxidation, those long chain fatty acyl coenzyme A molecules become acetyl coenzyme A, which is that thing that drives that TCA cycle as per before. The only difference being that this acetyl coenzyme A is being derived from fat now and not so much from, glu uh, from glucose, from carbohydrates. If there is a lot of fat pouring through that cell because you've consumed a great deal of fat, then absolutely you're still going to have a buildup of citrate in the mitochondria because it's the same brand, it's the same TCA cycle. That citrate will leak out into the cell cytosol exactly as it did before because it's the same citrate. That citrate will then be transmuted by an enzyme called ACL into acetyl coenzyme A in the cell cytosol which is a build-up molecule in this instance, rather than a breakdown molecule, that acetyl coenzyme A is then dealt with by another enzyme called ACC, or acetyl coenzyme A carboxylase, I think, from memory. And that forms a substance called melanol coenzyme A. Now, when that happens, melanol coenzyme A directly locks out the mitochondria at CPT1, as you can see down here, meaning no more fat can enter the mitochondria. The mitochondria is fully replete with acetyl coenzyme A, thanks very much, we don't need any more. It also will cause the long chain fatty acyl coenzyme A through a thing called FAS here to start building up triglycerides which then get exported to the blood, transported to the adipose tissue and stored there. Melanol coenzyme A basically is the molecule that tells the cell that it's now in an energetic condition where it needs to store fat for later. So instead of burning it, we're going to build it up into triacylglyceride molecules, export those to the blood. They can go straight off to the adipose tissue. Some of it gets stored, if this is a muscle tissue, some of it will be stored in the muscle, but most of it gets exported. At the same time, because we have a lot of acetyl coenzyme A, from all this fat, then our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex can't work and we can't produce a bunch of acetyl coenzyme A that way, again through allosteric inhibition. Therefore, we are now unable to use sugar so much. And of course, we get a backup of sugar in that situation. And then that other situation I've just shown you comes into effect and GLUT4 gets locked out. Hello, insulin resistance. And that's what the vegans will tell you. If you eat a lot of fat, that'll cause insulin resistance without telling you that so will a lot of sugar. Both these situations are in effect at once, at the same time, at all times. So what we've got really to boil all of this down to its simplest form is that a lot of fat will lock out both fat and sugar. A lot of sugar will lock out both fat and sugar. Basically, what we've got is too much energy in the blood will be locked out of the cells to protect the cells from damage. Those energy substrates will then pull in, this, in the fluid outside the cells, the blood, and then the liver will deal with those substances largely by storing them as fat on your body, and your cells will be what they call insulin resistant, while ever that situation is in effect. If you eat a diet which is a carnivorous diet, which is rich in fat and protein necessarily, that's fine. If you, if you consume no carbohydrates, you will not be causing yourself a Randall cycle issue. As such, you will be lean and mean and fit and healthy if you subscribe to that diet appropriately and you do it for long enough to reverse the damage that you've done in years leading up to it. A lot of people think, you know, you change your diet to carnivore and everything will be perfect within five minutes, to which I always say to my clients that ask me, well, I've been carnivore for six months now and I'm still a bit fat and, you know, what I usually ask them, well, how long did it take yeah. you to mess your health up? Why do you think it's going to heal in five seconds flat? It's going to take some time. Anyway.
that's for another day. So a carnivore diet, no Randall cycle issue to speak of because there's no carbohydrate to cause a problem because there's no cross inhibition. There's no competition for the substrate to get through the cell. You could also eat a vegan diet if you like because that's rich in carbohydrate necessarily and a little bit poor in fat. I say a little bit poor in fat because there's still a lot of fiber in a vegan diet and that still breaks down to short chain fatty acids. Whoops, we're still with an issue. Just not as much as if you were eating a bunch of vegetable oils and fats as well. Like all these vegans are saying, eat a, eat a plant-rich diet, don't eat any oils, don't eat any fats, you'll be all right. You'll be slim. And it's true, you will, because you're not activating the Randall cycle. Right. However, what you'll also be is vastly, grossly, patently, nutritionally deficient on a vegan diet. Yeah. It does not contain the nutrient you require on a daily basis to keep you healthy or to give you the longest possible lifespan, the happiest possible life. You'll be miserable. You'll be ill. Your health will catastrophically abandon you at some point, probably within five years on a vegan diet because it is so destitute of required nutrient. We started eating plants about 8,000 years ago in the agrarian revolution. Absolutely disastrous for our health. We got shorter, we got weaker, we got less muscular, our skeletal structures shrunk, our facial, our jawline shrunk, our, our dental situation became a problem with all the wisdom teeth and cramming up of teeth. We got tooth decay from all the, the carbohydrate-loving bacteria in our mouths eating our teeth. We got gluten intolerance, you know, we got irritable bowel. We got, I mean, they've, they've looked at Egyptian mummies who, I mean, Egyptians grew a lot of grains and ate a lot of grains atherosclerosis, hitherto unseen, you know, all these things. Every single time you eat a meal which is rich in both carbohydrates and fats, you will absolutely oh, right, activate the Randall fatty, cycle okay. every time without fail. Okay. And the, the Randall cycle will probably okay. remain highly activated after that meal for a number of hours. Right. In the case of when you have mixed carbohydrates and fats. When you think about this for a minute, Judy, when people talk about going on a ketogenic diet and all the pundits will say to you, well, it's going to take you about 72 to 96 hours at least to get into ketosis. The reason for that is precisely because that's how long it takes to drain your body of those extra carbohydrates. So if you eat carbohydrates at any time, you can expect Randall cycle activation for 72 to 96 hours. So when people say, oh, I'll just eat my fat in the morning and my carbohydrates in the evening, I'll be fine. No, I'm sorry. Anytime that your fat consumption is chronically higher than the amount of fat you are effectively oxidizing on a daily basis, there will be an overplus of fat and that will be stored as, as trace or glyceride as fat that will be stored on your body as fat. Absolutely. Oh, I just want to make the distinction though, because you know, there's a lot of people that come to carnivore and they're like, okay, I'm all in, I'll do meat. Hmm. But then they only eat the leanest meats because they're really deathly scared of fat. Yeah. And I don't want people to think that, well, fat makes you fat. It's just, if you eat more levels of energy than you need, mm. then you can actually gain weight on a carnivore diet. Yes. But it's not solely because you're eating fat. Correct. The, the, the thing though, however, the thing that kind of um, balances all of that out, Judy, is I challenge you to chronically overconsume food on a strictly 100% carnivore diet. Go for it. We'll wait. You can't do it. But if you add, okay, I, I agree if you only use meats, but mm. if you add cheese mm. if you add dairy mm -hmm. if you add other higher like with little little bits of carbs i do think you can overeat so if you eat yes. a lot of bacon yes if you eat a lot of cheese yes. a lot more of the process maybe Absolutely. Okay. so yeah. that's where my only caveat yes. would be All right but if you ate true just yes meat and fat no dairy just meat and fat <laughs> salt and water rinse and repeat okay. i challenge you to overeat on that diet for you might be able to do it for okay. a couple of weeks i've just done it for a couple of weeks myself but the, by the end of two okay. weeks of overeating on meat and fat, my body was like, that is enough, Charlie Brown, no more. You can't do it. You, the, the satiety signals, the hormone levels, everything right. are yeah. such that you, you simply will not chronically overeat on that diet. So it won't happen.